Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> so, yeah, my name is Stephen Borsi. Joining me online, uh, Mark Acanto and David Millington. We're here to go through uh, some of the kind of the cool stuff around uh, around the Sydney uh, release, and um, also talk about the market trends that are going on at the moment, and kind of get some of the inside track really about what's been driving um, you know, this release and and what's kind of coming through. So let me just kind of just jump onto my slides here a second. Uh, oh, get the right screen. There we are. Okay, so if, uh, if you have any questions at any point, then um, please feel free just to um, either pop them into the chat window, uh, or if you'd like to ask either of us specifically, then our emails are on the screen there, and we will kind of bring those back up at the end as well. So before we kind of get into this, really, the one thing I would like to say is that if you haven't already seen the launch webinar, definitely worth going to have a look at it. It was about, uh, it was almost two hours long live. It was so long, in fact, that we had had a break in the middle of it. We had intermission, I don't know if you had any popcorn or anything ready, but it was certainly a lot of really good stuff. And uh, what the guys have done is they've already edited down that main webinar into a number of different bite-sized videos. So you can go to the Embarcadero TechNet YouTube channel, and there you'll be able to find those uh, bite-sized videos to look into specific features, and also kind of see the whole replay of the, the main webinar. So our, our main kind of focus today isn't really to to delve into doing demos um, per se, but it's really more to talk about what's kind of been going on and and kind of the market areas. So, so maybe Sorry to interrupt, um, Stephen. Yeah, go. I was just going to say there that the bytes first videos are very small, so they're worth watching for an overview. But the the uh, full webinar has a lot more detail. Like the language server protocol one, I can see on screen is a minute forty six, yeah. but I think we spent about ten minutes sort of digging into detail in the webinar. So yeah. um. Basically, if, if the bite size one makes you interested, then, then the webinar is, is, is well worth watching. Yeah, 100%. Great. So let's let's move on to the uh, kind of the first introduction area, really, just to kind of set some of the scene around what's going on in the market. Marco, maybe do you want to say a few words on on kind of what's happening with uh, with Windows and and what's kind of going on in that area? Sure. So we, I mean, of course, I mean. Um, Rust Studio started as to as as a Windows focused development tool, and, and Windows remains the core focus area. I mean, we we embraced mobile, we embraced Mac, Linux, other platforms, and the the multi device strategy is critical for a lot of our customers. But it is true that Windows remains the 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 core element, and we shouldn't we shouldn't give it, take it for granted. For, for a couple of things. One is that Windows is uh, changing. Um, Windows is changing mostly through a couple of factors. One is the operating system adoption that, that changed. You can see this bluish line that is the Windows 10 percentage compared to all other versions of Windows uh, available, I mean, in use out there. So yeah, Windows 7 remains uh, relevant. With, with roughly 20% users, but Windows 10 has been growing and growing very significantly, and both in terms of, of you, and, and users, I mean, the, 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 the private use and, and companies, corporations, and so forth. So it is important to consider what's happening on the Windows platform. It's important for us, and, and it's important for you, because you are ultimately targeting the users on, on, on those versions. Windows 10, I mean, our approach is to try to add Windows 10 features maintaining compatibility with Windows 7. In, in Tempo, we have dropped support for Windows 7 as a development platform, so as, as the platform you as a developer use. Now, it, most things do still work, but uh, there is an increasing push to adopt uh, Windows 10 in full. And, and the reason is throughout, I mean, there are one of the reasons that one listed below officially Microsoft stopped supporting Windows 7, but that only has some influence in the market. Uh, 
people are still going to use it, companies are still going to use this, government are going to negotiate like another five years of, of support or whatever, they still have support for Windows XP. So it's a it's a slow it's a slow movement, it's not not overnight. But the, the other thing is that a lot of the Windows 10 features are really, really, I mean, it's extremely difficult to support not strictly Windows 10, but the Windows 10 hardware. And specifically, I'm referring to the entire high DPI, 4K monitors, multi-monitor type of systems. It's extremely difficult to support those in Windows 7 because, well, because Microsoft never provided a proper API for those. Like if we think about the multi-monitor support and what we have done in um, RAS Studio 10.3 in terms of integrating with the, per monitor, the new per-monitor APIs, um, that's, that's impossible to do on Windows 7. So uh, you can decide to stay on Windows 7 because a lot of your customers are there, but you should start embracing Windows 10 at its full, specifically around the high DPI features, and have some sort of failover so applications still work on Windows 7, but but are not optimal. That is that is what we see as as kind of the the, the most relevant overall trend. Uh, there is a second thing which is which just started, so it's something that's going to take a couple of years to to come in place, which is basically the complete new strategy that Microsoft is is putting together in terms of supporting Windows 10. Originally, Windows 10 was all universal Windows platform, migrate your code to WinRT, rewrite everything you have, which of course is insane. I mean, no developer has done it, whether they use Delphi, they use C++ Builder, they use Visual C++, they use uh, C Sharp, they use whatever. I mean, even those fully on the Microsoft platforms and, and tooling have not rewritten their application, just because Microsoft told them, hey, you should rewrite it. Uh, that that didn't work. So that was the old plan. Then they started embracing some sort of mixed plan. The initial Windows desktop bridge was a sort of transition. So use use it just while you're migrating your application type of thing. But again, you say, no, I'm not migrating. I mean, if I can make, make my application work better under UWP and be a better citizen in Windows 10, fine, but I'm not migrating. So now Microsoft has come to the full realization that people are not moving to their to the legacy systems, the legacy code. People are going to keep implementing the Win32 apps or, or native Windows apps. And so the new idea is just to provide new APIs alongside. And um, this, again, is something that formally has been announced at Build a month ago. So it's really new in terms of overall strategy, although people could see it coming, but the official strategy has been announced recently, and it's going to be made by basically creating new APIs, creating new subsystems, um, some of them using COM, some of them using WinRT, and making those subsystems fully usable for every customer on Windows 10. Most of them will be usable even for customers on Windows 7, which is surprising. And of also these libraries will not be tied to a new version of Windows 10, but will be available throughout. As an example, some of the high DPI features require a new version of Windows 10 because Microsoft implemented the API at a given point in time. The new model is, this is an add-on library that sits on top of the operating system. And so it can be applied to any version of Windows 10, again, even, even Windows 7. That is going to be the, the big push from Microsoft in, in the next couple of years. And we are monitoring it. We are already looking into it. We have even already implemented the first tidbit, which is the, the Edge Chromium browser support. This is part of the new strategy for Microsoft. And honestly, we, we, are, we are there ready, ready to, to play in this, this new or changing Windows 10 ecosystem. Yeah, it's nice to kind of see see us being back at that leading edge of things as well. Uh, some call it the bleeding edge, and certainly, you know, I know just even before we launched 10.4, uh, kind of the, the week before, Microsoft had made a, a change to some of the the edge browser technologies that we had to then update to to get ready for for the release, which was kind of 
which is kind of cool. But yeah, but but on top of the you know the Windows Store and having the first to market with the the Windows Desktop Bridge integration and having all the you know, Microsoft actually use us as a reference in terms of uh, what we've done with that for for developer tooling. It's really good to see kind of the the tools back at the front there. Cool. David, anything you want to add on, on that area for the moment? Nope. I should unmute. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I was typing a message to you actually and didn't want the, the keystrokes to, to occur in the in the audio. Uh, nothing on Windows 10. I'm looking forward to some of the, the discussion about the market strategy and uh, what's in 10.4, yeah. that kind of thing. Okay. So, yeah, obviously one of the other things that is quite clear uh, in the market nowadays is that uh, we've moved on a lot from where it used to be, you know, 80% or 85% or really of, of what you needed to worry about was just getting out to Windows. And now there's, you know, there's more Android devices connected to the, to the internet than there are Microsoft devices in, in terms of the, the desktop and mobile and, and tablet operating systems. And yeah, it, quite a quite a mix around where you need to kind of be going and i think the the kind of the key thing from this is that uh, you know the, the multi device strategy is something that is important to to applications uh, and certainly to kind of the traditional enterprise style applications that have been built with with delphi and uh, you know that kind of uh, focus of getting your apps ready for market and being supported by uh, a desktop application sorry, getting supported by the mobile application is kind of, uh, well, certainly something I see from the pre-sale side, you know, a lot of people now are asking about how they can support and reuse their existing code to add that 10% of functionality out onto the mobile side. And there's certainly been you know, a number of bits looked at over uh, recent releases around portability and moving code forward and, and those kind of things. Have you guys got anything you want to kind of share on, on some of the strategy around that area? No, sure. I can add a couple of more more elements here. I mean, mobile is mobile, and and and, and tablets and so forth are of growing importance. And on mobile, people don't terribly like browsing the internet using using the browser and and HTML based applications. So uh, there is a significant use case for native applications on. Uh, Running on on mobile devices for many reasons, uh, including including the optimizing the use of resources, reducing the extra bandwidth, and then try to try to keep things tight, and also have a nice looking uh, UI that is tied to to the platform. But it is also important to acknowledge that so like a couple of things that you you don't take an, a business app and clone it on, on on mobile that that's insane and illogical i mean most business apps are really data and en data entry centric required keyboard i mean uh keyboard and 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 tabbing through through items and entering stuff i mean when you start using the finger and and the and the keyboards available on on devices it's nothing's going to work so the, the concept is not taking what you have and moving it over. The concept is building new apps that work alongside the, the, the business apps. They might show data. They might allow some sort of input that takes advantage of the device capabilities, whether it's taking pictures or, or the GPS or any, anything else, a barcode scanner or anything else that the phone does, does better than, than the desktop. And so it is important to 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 focus on on those mixed user scenarios, which are which are certainly relevant. The other thing that's that we have seen emerging is a migration towards uh, running the application on, on 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 a Windows machine, but but seeing the UI uh, on on a different type of hardware. There are a lot of options, whether that. There are some Del even Delphi or, or Rust Studio specific ones or common ones like Amazon, Azure, and, and the big the big names in, in the cloud ecosystem that allows you to run an existing application as is, so like zero coding, zero change in your code, but be able to surface that UI and interact with it from any device. That has two, two effects. One is zero installation. So even if you're running even the client is on Windows, the advantage is there's no installation. It just you 
you hook from any computer, you put your, in your credentials and you're good to go. The other is that some of the rendering does make sense even on a, on a tablet or on a different type of device. And again, with, with almost a zero cost of, of development because taking a business app and for example, building it for the web in terms of cost is insane. I mean, it's really huge. And, and with the fact that, that web technologies tend to change every two years before you're, you're done, you're, you're using an old obsolete architecture. So it, it is, it's not, it's not exactly uh, an easy process. So we kind of encourage you to examine all of the other options. I mean, to take, take a view of what you need, what your customers need, and trying to use some creativity in, in building maybe not what they're asking, but something that works and does what they want. Which is which is slightly different. I think one of the other things there is the type of application that people are building as well. I mean, um, you know, obviously mobile devices are very popular, and it's 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 where you know people are very very aware of those at the moment. And you know, you'll see a lot of games that are targeted at mobile, and you know, lots of social media for which you have to have a mobile app and and that kind of thing. But in terms of business use. Applications are often still on the desktop and showing no signs of, of changing because people use, I mean, desktop is perhaps the wrong term, but you know they use a, a traditional computer, whether that's a laptop or, or something that is actually attached to their desk, you know, at at work, and you know, in in other areas, all sorts of, I mean, our customers write all sorts of applications, but you know they could be in in automation or you know factory industrial control or or something like that. All of these are run on machines that sort of count as what would have been years ago called PCs and now we call desktops. Even if it's you know in a factory, it won't really be a desktop, it'll just be sitting somewhere. But there's still that kind of device. Now obviously this really depends on the type of application because there are mobile first apps, absolutely. But especially for existing apps and for the sort of vast unseen software, you know, internal software that's that's used in in, in business is often still you know completely and, and fully around desktops yeah and no, i it is kind of quite nice seeing such a different mix and i have seen kind of you know the mobile first apps and i've, I've built a couple myself but uh, also you know one of the really nice ones that i saw with a, a uk based developer that had a, a timesheet module within their staff management system and offer different building sites and, and stuff like that. They have to accurately log in for audits and health assessments and time tracking and paying staff and a whole load of different business things. Originally they had complex, you know, paper-based or and they have to have a guy in the in the with a PC somewhere on site to be able to type the stuff in as it's happening. And and now the guys have got a ruggedized Android device they just take around. They're able to you know scan the badge that the, the staff have got and you know log the people in and out and do all that tracking and have that all automated through so it's about finding those tasks that are time intensive on uh, process complex and simplifying them with with the new technology stack and you know that was a couple of you know a handful of back-end service calls into existing business logic with a very simple mobile app and huge huge benefit into the business so yeah it, it is great to be able to kind of find those special bits that can really make a big difference in terms of the overall productivity of, of what you're doing as a solution so yeah that's a good point there are lots of areas where mobile devices have this kind of little add-on to, to the original application something I, I recall someone using um i forget the exact details but it was, it was a geographic system they were out in the field you know trying to map points Back in the day, they had to write stuff down on paper, go back to the office, re-enter it, and now they have like a little miniature app on their their mobile to actually enter stuff in, and or you know, just sync over you know wireless or you know the mobile network or something like that. Even though the majority of stuff is still done you know back back in the home office. Cool. Okay, so let's let's move on and. Uh, I one of the kind of the key areas we wanted to discuss within the session was around kind of the Windows 10 VCL enhancements within 10.4. Well, why don't we start at the top? I mean, Marco, <laughs> if you want to start with high DPI and VCL sure. styles. And, and um, yeah, in 10.4, in we've specifically done a few things around the improvement for, for Windows 10, 
mostly tied around uh, around the um, uh, high DPI 4K monitor support topic. We had already done quite a bit in 10.3, but what was still missing was the support for high DPI when for DCL styled applications, and that's where we wanted to go to, and and it is now available and it's very extensive. You have some ready to use high DPI styles. You can build your own. You can customize the styles. And overall, there is a concept that each of the images that make up a style can be made available at different DPI resolutions. So you don't, you're not just stretching or, or resizing the elements, but you can provide a 200% scaling re, uh, image, a 300% scaling image, a 400% scaling image for, for the monitors of the future, and, and so forth. So, the 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 new architecture is really is really new. It's significantly different from from the old uh, VCS styles, and offers a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can achieve uh, with a style application. That implies that when your form moves from one monitor to the other and they have different resolutions, the form adapts to the to the monitor uh, DPI. That means that you can really have smooth, crisp images when you're going off on a 4K monitor and so forth. Now, there is, we, we've made other changes alongside API chains or other things, but the other thing that we felt nice and important to even further push the adoption of VCL styles was in, also to allow the ability to go partial styled application. Because it is true that if you apply styles, maybe something doesn't work right. Maybe you have a component you've written that doesn't behave, or maybe you have a third-party component that is not aware and doesn't support styles, so that that UI doesn't doesn't look proper. So what you can do, you can disable styles for a form. You can disable styles for a control, or you can even have a different style. For a form or for a control. Now, the, the, the primary primary the, the primary use case is the ability to disable and select what styles are available, not really to build an application with eight buttons with eight different colors. That that looks reminds me of the early Delphi One VV interface where people say, "Oh, I can put colors everywhere. Let's put let's have everything a different color, everything a different font." Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, you can do it, but it's not it's not the, the goal. The goal is provide flexibility in, in application migration, excluding some forms that you don't want to style for any reason, and occasionally maybe have a colorful about box or a colorful spatial form that uses really uh, a, a different style. Uh, but it, it really adds a lot of flexibility. Again, specifically when when you have to considered usage of third-party controls, which a lot of our customers uh, do and have in their applications. Yeah, so that- Parker said there's with great response, uh, with great power comes great responsibility in terms of using the styles. Oh, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> I mean, and even some of our new demos, because we want to show what can be done are a bit borderline in terms of, okay, but does it make sense to do it? Well, maybe not, <laughs> uh, but yeah. The, 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 the next point you already mentioned, the, the TH browser, treat this as an experimental component until Microsoft releases the underlying control because it's not released. So right now you have to go through some hoops to, to use it. You need a specific developer version of, of Edge. Uh, you need the, this uh, third party, uh, the, the Microsoft SDK. You need to distribute a bunch of DLS. That might remain to be the case in, in, in the final. But it's great to be able to start experimenting and start building applications early. And then as Microsoft will release it, hopefully without breaking the interfaces, you'll have a solution ready to go. If there were great interfaces, we'll fix it and, and provide a patch so you'll be able to, 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 to use it in your, in your shipping applications. Yeah, the one thing I'll, I'll add to that, it's, um, if you are looking at um, having a play with it, um, there's a really good page on the DocWiki site, and the documentation is really good in terms of explaining what you need to do, where you need to go. And there's a README that's in the the T Edge browser sample that shipped with the product, and that kind of explains a bit about it, but it doesn't actually kind of point you to what you need to do 
per se to install it and get it up and going. So if you're having a play, just definitely go to the DocWiki and uh, it takes you straight to the two links that you need for the Canary web browser and, and also the download. Yeah, the, the other thing I want to mention here, because it, it's something we didn't underline in the, in, even in the webinar, and then I got a question last week from, from another uh, webinar, and it was really a very good point. In, in its final implementation, and again, we are waiting for Microsoft, there's nothing we can do there. Using the Edge browser will not require installing the Edge browser application on the Windows machine. Because they say, oh, but if, why should I tell my customers to install Edge? They're using Chrome, they're using Mozilla, they're using whatever they're using. That not, will not be a requirement. You'll be able to install the engine uh, as, as a sort of, of plugin, SDK, something you, you download, install from Microsoft, but that will not create the icons, the experience, the automatic going to Bing, whatever. I mean, it, it's, it's not, you won't have Edge as an application, as an icon on your desktop, you click onto and you start it. But you'll be the component the, the, the in, uh, available in your system, and so your DCL application will be able to use that component even if the customer hasn't got Edge on, installed on his machine, but just needs the Edge engine installed on the machine. That's a big difference because otherwise it will be, I mean, it will be still nice, but not as, as relevant because you're not in the business of telling your customers which browser they have to use, but you can certainly say, hey, install this Microsoft component, uh, or maybe even embed that in your installation, and, and that will smoothly have the, the engine on the customer computers. Okay, David, I know you've done quite a bit of work around the, the custom title bar area, haven't you, within within 10.4. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I have, yeah. Um, well, actually, there, there are a few things there. The IDE in, in 10.3 sort of changes its look and feel, and you know, we put a couple of controls on the title bar, uh, but that was using VCL styles. So the title bar in, in 10.3.x was you know, a pure VCL style title bar, so it was quite easy to, to drop a VCL control on it. But of course, many applications you know, many web browsers, for example, um, you know, office style, you know, word processing, that, that kind of thing. But even Windows Explorer, if, if you look at the applications today, they, they all sort of use a title bar differently. You're know, placing extra information, extra controls. You know, it's not really today that you just have a window caption icon and minimize and maximize, and that's that's it. So for us, for example, we had, and you know, have in 10.4 as well, uh, desktop layout controls on the title bar because you know every option that you choose for the layout affects everything within the window uh, so it makes sense on the title bar you know anything on the title bar you know, really applies to the to the entire window itself uh, so desktop layout for example is something that belongs on on the title bar and what we wanted to do was to support building this kind of you know whether that was using vcl styles or just using you know an unstyled application you know a window style application for our, for our customers. So we, we have a new VCL control to do that. And that's the one we introduced in 10.4, and that uses the real Windows title bar. So you know, if you run on Windows 7, you'll get the, the semi-transparent rounded look. If you run on Windows 10, it'll be you know, white by default, depending on your, your settings, that kind of thing. And it's very powerful. You can add any controls you want. Uh, you can add you know, toolbars and toolbar buttons. You can change its height. You can fully custom paint it. Uh, we added support for, for adding new buttons that sit next to the minimize and maximize and close buttons, that kind of thing. And with this, you can build the same style of UEs that you'll see in web browsers and you, know, you see in Explorer and, and that kind of thing without requiring anything. Uh, you know. To be honest, writing this kind of stuff is very difficult. It's not easy to use the APIs to, to customize a Windows title bar. So you, know, you, you can achieve all of that right through to complete custom painting without, without having to use any of those. I find it really important to support modern style user interfaces. I think many people want, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, want to write apps that look modern and behave in a modern way, and this is a, a key way to do that. Yeah, and it's true to the Delphi way of doing it with a, a simple component that abstracts the, the complexities out of the way for you. So. 
Yeah, well, we actually have levels as well. I mean, your form has a custom title bar property now through which you can customize a few sort of basic things. And the advanced stuff comes in when you drop a, a T title bar panel on the form and, and you hook it up. The panel is what sort of acts as a, a, you know, a, a component for holding other controls, basically. You know, if you want an edit box or something, then your VCL edit has to sit on a VCL control, and that's, that's the T title bar panel. And that sort of opens up a lot of the really advanced things, you know, custom drawing and, and placing controls and that kind of stuff. So yeah, we, we have, you know, fairly basic stuff and, and some quite advanced as well. And, and the stepping stone there is nice as well. Cool. Which kind of almost nicely leads us into the next section because you know, the whole reason behind that is to help developer productivity and to improve you know, the, the performance and the speed of what developers can do and, and achieve with their time. And I know that's been a kind of a key area of consideration from the product team through the 10.4 release. So David, do you want to do you want to kick us off on this one? Because I know the, the LSP area has been pretty much, you know, David is kind of responsible pretty much for the IDE within the product management team. So I'll, I'll let you kind of uh, kick off on the, the LSP side, I think. Well, this is a really exciting one, and it's one I've spent many, yeah. many months working on. I'm really happy to, to talk about. Yeah, Delphi LSV is probably one of, if, if not the, the primary feature, I think, or you know, the first feature of, of 10.4. Sounds bad to say that because 10.4 is one of the biggest releases we ever had. And as you said, we had to have a two-hour webinar to cover everything, but it's certainly a, a very big feature. And basically, it's, it's a redesign of, of Code Insight, of, of how Code Insight works, you know, code completion and your know, navigation and error insight and you know that that kind of thing and you know Delphi introduced that in uh, I think code completion was added in Delphi 3. Yeah um, I think that's correct. Yeah and uh, you know, it was it was wonderful then but uh, you know we found over the years that it needed tweaking and changing and redoing it and rebuilding it was was the right thing to do and basically this this allows us to put it you know, outside of the IDE, it runs asynchronously in its own process, communicates back and forth to the IDE. None of this is visible to you unless you look for it. But, um, you know, effectively what it means is, uh, you know, the IDE has, uh, you know, a lot more memory to dedicate to, to all the, the calculation it has to do. You know, everything's asynchronous, so you can sort of keep typing in the IDE while it's working out co-completion results and, you know, that, that kind of thing. It's, uh, you know, a huge, huge step. I can talk about that for half an hour. You probably don't want me to talk about it for half an hour, but yeah, it's 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 really good. I I want to touch very shortly on on two things that 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 are part of the developer productivity and improvement uh, in in the way you write the code. Kind of two core elements. One is the fact that we have unified the memory management model throughout the various platforms, going back to the good old uh, Delphi VCL type of memory model and it is it's not ideal in terms of uptake for new developers because you need to understand memory management a little bit compared to garbage collection and even compared to automatic reference counting but it's true that each model requires you ultimately to understand what you're doing and avoid making mistakes and also the um, memory model we have unified to is first is proven of many years and is extremely stable. And honestly, memory leaks are not the major issues of, of Delphi developers around the world because of the various options that you have from, from component ownership, from using interfaces which retain the ARC and, and all of the other options that are in the language. But also it's very performant. I mean, performance does matter for, for Rust Studio developers. And so we don't want to lose performance to embrace something that could, could be nice, but also affects the existing code up to the point you have to do some sort of substantial rewrite of, of, of what you have. The other big thing is, is the custom managed record. So the ability to determine what happens when a record is allocated um, directly, indirectly through a local variable within, within an existing uh, type hosting the record and then in all, all the other scenarios uh, inside an array or whatever. And what happens when the record is removed from memory 
and what happens when you do a copy of the record data structure to a similar record data structure because you, you do an assignment or you pass a record as parameter. This is now all customizable. You can write your own code for each of these three operations, and that adds additional value to, to records, which have been growing in, in the scope and the role, starting with, with the addition of methods and, and um, operators overloading in the Delphi 2010 timeframe, and then more recently with, with uh, a bunch of other additional extensions and features. The records are very powerful. They make sense in, in a language as an alternative to using classes and objects. And I'm quite happy we, we are investing on in further improving how records work. Oddly enough, after we implemented this, we found out that other languages that have been a bit, a bit, we've relegated records kind of a second class citizen, like C Sharp, have, are now putting them back to, to the spotlight. So it seems kind of a trend, not something we are we are doing. We we are the only one doing. Yeah, no, I I, I love the the LSP support. I think it's it's making a big difference. Some of the feedback initially from the field has been um, amazing. We've had customers who for years have turned off code completion because they've just found it too much of a uh, a challenge around around things, and now they they're really happy with it, swimming along. And I love the fact now also that. If there is any problem in that area, it doesn't crash the IDE. It's <laughs> it just kind of keeps going. It's a separate process. It's just kind of let it do its own thing, reset itself, and come back. And you know, it, just from a developer point of view, it just it makes the experience what it should be, which is which is a huge plus. Yeah, I'd add as well that I mean, I mean you mentioned people who have turned code completion off for, for years and using it again, which is wonderful i think it's a sign of, of a good feature but uh you know if, if you do have any trouble with code completion using lsp then uh, we have a much better system now for diagnosing what goes wrong as well so our documentation page on lsp has a section right at the bottom about turning on logs we have very extensive logging and you can file a qp report with those logs or send them through support logs can include your, your code so just just be aware of that but that makes it vastly easier for us to, to figure out you know what happens if if if, if there's you know any, any glitch there. So hopefully you won't see a glitch, but certainly if you do then uh, you know it's it's much easier to, to resolve. I think I, I, I really like just the fact that it's asynchronous. I like being able to type and have the ID just just carry on. Yeah yeah I, I it, it's honestly a great feature it's something that that it does a huge difference in the product. But it's the start of a new foundation as well. So it's not that, okay, we're done. I mean, now we have a foundation that we can build on for improving what it is, adding capabilities, extending to other areas of the product that still rely on old, unstable technologies, and, and so forth. So it's, it's really a starting point for, for the next 10 or 15 years. Like this has been for 20 something years a, a core tenet of the IDE and I mean it it was the first IDE that introduced this concept that came before Visual Studio had IntelliSense or even the name and before some of the other languages started doing it and it's now extremely popular. Now we are one of the first major IDEs to embrace the kind of new wave which is which is using LSP. Of course there are others that have been driving it, like, like Visual Studio Code, but some of the major IDs are still only partially embracing LSP or are not there yet. So which we think this is a great direction, and it's, it's also replacing a closed, proprietary, embedded, and untestable system <laughs> with an open system, uh, which, which really is, is great. Yeah, I think adopting open protocols for this kind of thing is is fantastic. And it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, we we tend to present, you know, in the ten point four webinar, for example, we we tend to present features. So, you know, redesign code in sight and you know asynchronous and all, all that kind of stuff is is a feature. And what we don't really tend to discuss so much is sort of the the strategy behind it or, or why we chose what we have chosen and and where we're looking ahead. 
And I guess since this is a sort of open chat, there's probably a good place to, to do that here with, with LSP. So you reminded me, Marco, by, by mentioning uh, sure. strategies. So, so thanks mm -hmm. for that. But um, yeah, I mean, this, this, this particular approach wasn't chosen out of the blue. It, uh, it really does open up a, a lot of possibilities, you know, as well as being an open protocol, you know, which, which does open support for, for using other languages within the, the RAS Studio ID uh, right now. You know, you can use other LSP servers if they communicate at I.O. There's also the potential of, you know, what LSP will, will let us do. You know, we have passes within the IDE that perform particular functions. You know, the uh, structure view, for example, is, is populated by a particular parser. And uh, where we're really looking at some of the strengths of having some of these you know, language models available that your LSP can, can communicate. So, you know, if, if you're interested in extending the IDE, for example, then you might be interested in, in the kind of information that we might be able to make available at some point. You know, the, the same information that populates the, the, the structure view. And, you know, of course, LSP has, has many other features as well. I don't really want to talk too much in specifics because a lot of this is sort of stuff that's being thought about rather than, you know, stuff that we have a specific plan for a specific version. But I do want to be clear that this this leads in a sort of very powerful direction that really sets us up for hmm. you know enabling all the stuff, whether it's in the ID itself or within you know other tooling or or, or something like that. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Keith on the chat here is um, saying I've he's loving it because it's got rid of the big red error messages, uh, the squiggles that were were coming up. Well, that's a good point. All, all the error insight messages, whether they're in the code editor or in the, the structure pane, should actually be correct now, <laughs> which, uh, it's, which it's is fantastic. It's basically a copy of the um, compiler, isn't it? Checking the it, code. It really, saying, yeah, is yeah. yeah. This is... yeah. We, we, we are using the Delphi compiler as, as a service in, in the LSP server, and so all the information there comes back from the compiler. And that's why the errors are correct, because you're actually getting the compiler's view of, mm -hmm. of your code just updated as you type. Yeah, and it also means additional memory in the IDE for other components to be loaded in, and uh, it just opens up a whole load of additional things for supporting it. So um, mm. it, it really has made a, a, a huge difference. So. Cool. What's next down the list then? Do you want to talk a little bit about the C++ libraries, David? Oh, sure. I'll talk about a couple of C++ things, actually. I mean, we've been working to add popular open source C++ libraries in, in Get It over the past year or so, and a couple of reasons for that. One of them is just that you know, we want to make it easy for SeaBuilder customers to, to use popular libraries in you know, the C++ ecosystem is, is wide. And you know, of course, you can always download something and, and start using it, but it's great just to have it in Get It and be able to, to, to have it available. And you know, there's some really powerful C++ libraries. Boost, of course, is the obvious one, which we've supported for many years, but we're, we're really working on adding a, a lot of others. The other thing that lets us do is, um, you know, as, as we test against various open source libraries, it, it ensures that we, you know, we support them. And that really helps our quest for compatibility. You know, we want to make sure that you can pick up any C++ code and, and use it in CBuilder and being able to test against open source libraries there really, really helps that. You know, if you're using other libraries with CBuilder and uh, you, know, you have them on GitHub or something, then uh, you would be happy to publish them and get it as well. Uh, you know, we'd be really interested in that. So you know, if you're doing that, please, please drop us an email. But one of the other C++ things that's, that's really big, and pardon me, I, I need some tea, is the, the new debugger. So this, again, is you know, it's a fairly major feature, you know, dropping a whole new debugger into, into a release. So you know we've we've been moving and focusing heavily on on the Clang compilers, but uh, debugging when you were compiling with Clang often wasn't nearly as good as it was with with the classic compiler for for a wide variety of reasons. And uh, for Win64, that's that's now right up there again. You know, it's based on a recent version of, of LDB. It has a, a really nice feature. One of the key problems with C++ debugging is I mean C++ is quite good at optimizing things out. So if a method is inlined, then the method's there in your code and you can see your code calling it, but you might not be able to evaluate it in the debugger because the method doesn't really exist in a callable form anymore. It's, it's been inlined. 
you know, that might happen if it's declared even even in the header or, or if it's you know marked to be inlined. All the various other reasons why code might not you know, actually be accessible to, to the debugger. And this can be a problem when you're trying to evaluate you know, your data types or, or your classes or, or something like that. If you have a string, for example, or, or, or a vector, you, know, you want to access, let's say with a vector, you want to access the array operator to, to see a particular element. Well, that's almost certainly not going to exist as a callable function within your app because the vector is fully defined in, in header files. And the compiler, even then, you know, a debug build will uh, not expose that as a separate callable function. So this is a common problem across many C++ toolchains, not not just ours, and it's solved for us in in 10.4 with with the new debugger. We're using things called formatters, which are little plugins to the debugger that are aware of you know, particular areas, such as particular data types, like a vector, where this is a problem and lets you evaluate them anyway. And you can actually extend this if you have your own data types that you know, because of the quirks of C++, you might have issues debugging. You can write a, a plugin as well for, for the OLDB debugger. Uh, so it's a really powerful feature, you know, as well as just sort of adding in a whole bunch of really good debugging stuff. This uh, really helps the whole overall C++ debugging experience. Just to finish off on the screen that we've got here, the the last two bits about almost kind of grouped together in one really. It's about the new packaging and updating via Get It and the new unified installer. And I've already experienced, I don't know if it was by design or just how it kind of fell through, um, but we let everybody experience on day one the ability to do an update through the, the Get It package updates. And that was it. It, the, the nice thing about that the, was literally everybody's going, Oh my goodness, this is just so much easier. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, really no, we're going to show you this feature by doing a day zero patch just for you. So. <laughs> yeah, it well, wasn't intentional. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Marco, go ahead. Yeah, it wasn't intentional, but it ended up nice that we had that, that option. So yeah, that, that there's a new way to, to provide patches. If you yeah, get it, get it has been made significantly more powerful. We can also allow installing patches as you shut down the IDE, so in, in, in a way other application work, you have to shut down the application so you can replace any file on, on shutdown. And there's a lot that, that was made available. Also on Gatit, now each package has a timestamp that allows us to sort the, the packages by release date. So we want, what did they add this week? Rather than going through everything and try to figure out, you can sort by, by release date, which is handy. And given we have a release date, we can release a, another copy of the same package with a new release date. <laughs> and that implies that um, it, that's an update. And when there's an update available, the system lets you uninstall the old one, install the new one. But the system can figure out that what you have installed compared to what is available are, are a different timestamps so or a different date. So you, the fact that you miss an update, and in fact there is an updates category that you can that you can uh, check to see oh if is any of the packages I've installed is any of those has a new version. So uh, that's that's kind of an easy easy process. We made a few other things that that we are surfacing over time, and and yeah, the new installer. That's mostly good for us because we don't have to maintain two. So basically, you can package everything that that get it would would do during installation, put it in a single humongous large five plus megabyte gigabyte file, and, and that's everything you need to install. So you can install offline and and have everything with the same set of files, the same information from from the standard installation. Cool. And the new unified installer as well uh, it means it's, a, it's kind of slightly different from before. I, I know I used to either use the web installer or use the ISO, and I sometimes would, you know, depending on what we need to test or whatever, you'd use one or use the other just so we get a mix of different things being run through. And I invariably ended up using the uh, ISO in the last couple of releases, which was then a pain trying to update and make changes. So it's just really nice to be able to. <laughs> Uh, have the unified experience now. It's just so much nicer. Okay, let's let's just move on. And the 
the next section here is about speed and performance in 10.4. So I know there's been quite a bit of work going on in this area. Now I, I've been, you know, a, a number of people will know, you know, I'm involved in the world of basketball. Uh, you can probably see my shirt when we you were know, on the British universities many years ago. Up in there. Uh, and I've been writing an application for basketball referees with kind of exam questions and resources and bits on. And so I've been going through the, the process of updating that to 10.4 recently. And the speed update through the metal drivers for, for iOS, it is smooth. It really is smooth. You know, the lists, you know, I've got lists with you know, 300 faces with images and the text and everything on it. And compared to before where, you know, it, it was OK, it was good. Um, a little bit, you know, you could tell it was a little bit draggy. But now on the metal stuff, it screams. It really is nice. Uh, I know that was a kind of a a big part of what's kind of gone through for some of the mobile side in, in this release, is not it? Yeah, we've done a lot. And I, I don't want to spend too much time here also because, well, we have another 30 minutes and we, we yeah. have to go through questions and everything. But we, we have replaced a lot of the subsystems and that, that specifically for the Apple platforms that were either old slash deprecated or, or not the best experience like, like Metal. We have also improved the, the SDK slash API level for Android. So in, you, you should be good up to, up to with the deadlines coming in August and, and November. We have support for the launch storyboard. That is a requirement end of June. Now, Apple two days ago invented another requirement midway with some icons that's missing, but uh, there, there is already a workaround. We'll, we'll, we'll work on, on, on a fix. I mean, at times they just do things without, without it. Fine, but so trying to stay ahead of the curve in terms of the, the, the requirements at the low level. And also we spend quite some time in, in optimizing code, whether it's, it's some of the core RTL, whether it's the language server protocol, and whether it's some of the RTTI that is behind the, the live bindings and the live bindings overall. And we've also focused on a few areas that was starting in 10.3, 10.4 will continue in, in 10.4 updates. Um, areas like up tethering, the parallel programming library, and so forth. These are being looked after both in terms of performance, but also in terms of quality and robustness and, and overall improvements. Cool, David, anything specific you want to call out on, on here? Not much to add. I think Marco covered it really well. But we've had a lot of good feedback about the performance, you know, about live bindings, about RCTI in general, and I'm really excited about the parallel programming changes as well. PPL is a really powerful library, and I, I think we were talking about sort of developing stuff for modern approaches earlier. You know, we were talking about modern UE with you know, a title bar, which you know, it's, it's just the user interface, but equally modern is that uh, single-threaded applications are, you know, it's, it's not really the way people are, are doing things today because you have a lot more resources available, and mm -hmm. if you want to do a lot in your application, then, then you have to do it in parallel. And so now is a really good time to, to revise that library and we did some fantastic work there. So I'm, I'm really excited about that one. Yeah, no, it, it really is nice. And, you know, I, I did a little bit of work recently uh, on uh, a customer project with that where they were downloading a whole load of images from the web to cache locally and uh, just putting the, the parallel for loop in and fetching the, the bitmaps down in parallel just made such a difference to the speed and performance of the operation processing through. And it was so easy to refactor in. I mean, it literally took you know, two minutes to put into the code you know, on, on what was there already. So yeah, it is a really elegant library, which is really cool. Okay, anything else uh, you guys want to add on the, the speed and performance area? I actually thought of something on the previous slide. We mentioned Get It, and Marco was talking yeah. about uh, different versions. So yeah, we had the patch available in, in Get It, which is fantastic, and we showed that already. We actually showed the versioning already because we have a, a couple of packages at least that have already been updated. IDE add-ons that we released a week or so ago. Bookmarks and Navigator actually have a, a new release as of a, a day or so ago. And so if you installed those a week ago and you go to get it, you'll see this little sort of amber refresh icon on, on the entry. It has like these two sort of circles, kind of refresh symbol. Click that and it'll reinstall. It's, uh, it's really nice. 
Yeah, and in terms of the, the Get It Package Manager, um, then a lot of the, the third-party controls are now updated and available through there, aren't they? Um, like the Canopka signature controls, the you know the fast reports. There's a whole load of bits that are uh, in there and, and available. Yeah, I think we published the Canopka ones a few days ago as well, Michael. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Canopka one is now up and running. So the radiant shapes, and I think since yesterday we also had the the um, JCL and JVCL, which are the most downloaded open source third party libraries. These have libraries we that are part of the product somehow. So yeah, we 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 see continuous use of of get it. It's a nice system, and we're looking forward to expand and extend it. Okay, so we just got one more slide, and then went to kind of the uh, the Q and A. I, I can hear a couple of questions have been answered in the meantime, anyway. So it's all good. So why move up to ten four? In fact, before we kind of uh, delve into this, I'm just going to throw up a couple of quick polls. So David uh, asked me to uh, specifically for this one earlier. So which which language are you guys using at the moment? Uh, Delphi, C++ or both? So we'll, we'll try and keep these open for a little under 40 seconds or 45 seconds each. So go ahead and, and please vote in. We'll see uh, there's a few seconds lag on, on the display from, from my end here. So I'll... I'll give that a, a few seconds just to kind of get up. You know, it's terrible, Stephen, is that because I'm a panelist, I can't vote. <laughs> okay, well, about 40% of people voted so far, about 5% using both, and then around about 10, 15% using C++ and the rest on Delphi. Okay, so let's, let's close that poll and we'll just go on to the next one quickly. So I've got two similar questions here. So we're going to ask, first of all, what's the latest version you use? So, you know, which version do you currently have that you use, um, the latest version that you're using? So a really strong showing here for, for 10.3 and 10.4. I would have split those out into two separate ones if I had uh, enough question space, but only, we're only allowed to put five uh, options in here. So we've kind of gone for the, the pre-Unicode, the post-Unicode, the the 64-bit version of Windows, and then the the kind of 10 point something. So, so just whilst that's uh, going there, uh, there's a question here, David, uh, in terms of some of the updates around the parallel programming library in 10 10.4. Are there any specific points that uh, you kind of want to flag out? Sure, I should probably hand that over to Marco. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really yeah. excited about it, but it was Marco who uh, who uh, looks after it. Um, yeah, we started looking into some of the performance issues. There were problems uh, with, with thread start delay, uh, task start delays, and some of the other scenarios. We started with two or three of the, of the most problematic issues. But the other thing we did was rework the testing infrastructure for, for the parallel library, because with the testing infrastructure, we can make more change and add features more easily rather than what was attempted in the past. Around 10.2 and 10.3, we did a couple of fixes, and invariably those fixes to some of the core system would uh, uh, cause something else to break. So, and, and we had limited tests, so we, we did the startup investment mostly on writing tests, and then we started fixing some of the bugs, and then we continue on both directions. We have more tests and, and, and more bug fixed throughout the 10.4 the 10.4 uh, updates. Cool. So I shared the, the results of that previous one. I'll just launch the next one in. So, so what's the oldest version that you're using? So this is really kind of regular use. Well, <laughs> we put uh, 2007, right? I just kind of kept it consistent. So if, are you a pre-Unicode? Sure. But uh, yeah, so I, I know a number of people have the newer versions, but they're still doing a lot of their day-to-day -day work in, in some of the older versions. So, you know, where, where are you doing your day-to-day -day work, uh, basically, today? Uh, I guess, kind of, um, you know, for me, one of the things that I'm seeing a lot at the moment is that you know, a lot of people are now working towards how they can move their code up from the older versions because because of the changes in terms of what the Windows APIs are providing and the, the different kind of hardware and bits that are in place now. Uh, especially with the multi-monitor support and the different resolutions per monitor and all those other kind of things that have kind of come in uh, recently that Windows 10 are, are really doing a uh, you know, 
a great job in kind of enabling you know it's 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 a, a big reason to kind of update and if you're needing any kind of support internally to help uh push that time that you need to get those things updated. Um, a part of the handouts here that hopefully you'll be able to see in your GoToWebinar um, panel there is a, a top five market trends white paper that we've um, put together internally here. Uh, and that talks a lot about some of the challenges that developers are facing up to with, you know, with Windows 10. So uh, definitely worth having a look at. Okay, so uh, still, uh, a good showing for the top, but a lot of people still working a lot on the on the older versions too. So yeah, I've, you know the one thing I definitely say is there's um, support on the, the migration upgrade center. I recorded a, a video with uh, Al Marino and Mary Kelly just a couple of weeks ago now, where we uh, kind of go through the top tips for for migrating code and, and working through those bits. The number one thing was definitely just sort out third party components and and any libraries that you're kind of linking into and and take it from there but definitely worth having a look through and there are support you know services and bits available from us if you need help kind of getting through some of those migrations um, to get up to the latest okay so why move to 10.4 i think i think we kind of touched on a couple of those bits there just through the poll questions really you know the, the support that we have for, for windows 10 is is phenomenal and the you know certainly from a migration point uh, one of the key things from the, the the recordings we did the other week was how easy it is to kind of take advantage of some of those you know, new uh, Windows API through the components that have been added in. You know, swapping out image lists for new images with the different resolutions in them, you know, is is a great way to be able to overcome you know one of the major hurdles really for Windows 10 UI look and feel because if you can't see what the icon is, then literally it's a useless bit of space on the screen that's being used by something. And so definitely you know, those kind of things make a big, big difference to the usability of your applications for migrating up. I think uh, you know, the, the VCL styles uh, and the per control styling uh, is making it much easier to you know, move into newer platforms and take advantage of some of the nice new VCL styles that are around, but also still support nicely controls that don't support styling like some of the third party controls some of the popular third party controls that don't and having that ability to blend between the two really does make a big difference to how your applications can look and you know sometimes that that freshen up that the the vcl styling can give just puts an extra lease of life that the marketing teams can put behind your products and and really kind of push on with so you know a great way to, to add value into your applications the extensive compatibility with existing code, you know, I think that's one thing that it always strikes me here in you know, kind of the internal conversations here and and also you know, listening to the, the pain that I hear from other developers around the world with you know, code that's not easily migrated in the tooling that they're using is that it is a phenomenal job that we've done in terms of the portability of code and, and being able to move it up and move it through versions. And I think you know, the introduction the reintroduction of the, the ASCII strings and, and stuff like that um, can also help migrate code up, uh, especially if you're not worried about Unicode. You know, that, that is a great way to be able to smooth that migration for some of the older code that's still in you know, 2007 before. And 39% you know, of you saying that you're still using stuff back then. You know, if, if the Unicode is the reason you've not moved through, then you know, there's some great news there to, to help make that jump now in, in the current release. Anything else on those top three that you guys want to, to add or share? I was sort of thinking about migrating in general. I mean, uh, the number of people using 2007 or older was slightly higher than I expected. And I, I know we have people who, who still do use them, but uh, we, we see a lot of people you know, interested in, in, in upgrading. And as well as like the versions, I mean, the, the, the points here on screen are about some of the, you know, the features in 10.4, but you know, there's a lot of reasons to upgrade and migrate in, in general. You know, there's sort of more overarching, whether it's you know supporting, you know, current operating systems, for example. You know, something built and that built with Delphi Seven won't won't run properly on on Windows Ten in in many cases, mm. or operating system features like High DPI or you know, the productivity features, just the language additions. I remember, um, you know, I, I had to go back as I think I was using XC Four, and I had to go back to 2010, and and I found it terrible. You know, how how could I live in Delphi 2010 when I was used to Delphi X4? And you know that same thing is is true for for all the newer versions. 
you know, there's there's a huge number of reasons. And I, I think sometimes people feel a little stuck because upgrading does take work. We we do try to provide a lot of resources there and you know the community members as well who've who've done this and, and can help. You know, it's it, it's always a lot easier to stay up to date when you're already up to date because you know the version increment, you know, if you're on ten point three, it's very easy to go to ten point four. And you know, that's been true for all the past versions. You know, when you have a big version difference it perhaps can seem a bit more more work and, and more intimidating. I view it a, a bit like that sort of old saying about planting a tree. You know, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago, but the second best is today. And it's the same for upgrading. You're going to have to do it. Uh, now is, you know, if you haven't already done it, now is is, is the best time. Yeah, I, I agree. And and honestly, we, we really put a lot of focus in trying to maintain uh, extensive compatibility. There are breaking change here and there that, that we have to do for various reasons. But there is, there is, I mean, we know that the most important asset that you have as developers is your source code. And so anything we do to make the source code useless or, or invalid or requiring a large rewrite, it's something we are, we are taking away from your, your developer experience. But it's true that, uh, I mean, if you, if you stop on some, some very old version and don't keep it going, keep it moving, then there will be some, some, Hiccup in migration, but still, I mean, it's if you look around, I mean, to other to other solutions, I, honestly, I think there's no other. Uh, maybe if it's good cobalt, uh, if you're working on a bank, there is no other option for you out there to take. I mean, old code, uh, modernize it in terms of the internal code, the internal architecture, modernize the UI, move up to the latest version of Windows or even move it to, to, to mobile platforms and still retain the largest majority of what you have written. If you look at what Microsoft has been doing over the years, what what the job what happened in the Java world in terms of UI libraries or other libraries, what happened in in, in on other platforms where language change and and even the same libraries now supported by a new language. I mean if you see the extensive change that are required every year to to the code base the developers have, what what Rust Studio allows you to do is to kind of move to your own pace is is actually remarkable. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, let's just um, quickly um, scan down the rest of these things here. We we had a great conversation earlier about the the code insight and the productivity gain from that, and and kind of the benefits from there. You know, the Windows VCL components. You know, I love the fact that we can use those and still have backward portability onto Windows 7 and have that kind of new look and feel with components because the way they've been put together, which is, you know, it's just phenomenal. It just really does mean that you don't have to choose between Windows 7 and Windows um, 10, or should I say Windows 8.1 now, because obviously Windows 7 is not supported anymore by Microsoft, but we all know a lot of businesses are still kind of dragging their heels getting off of it. The REST support, I, I think is absolutely phenomenal. The you know, some of the underlying updates that have been made over the last few versions around that area. And again, and here uh, has done a great job making that very, very easy to use and, and take away some of the pain around making that secure as well and, and using that. Certainly the, the one thing that I would definitely say is make sure that you picked up that, you know, with the Enterprise and the Architect Edition now, there is a license for RAD server deployment included with your license of the product. You know, before, you know, there used to be you know, a per seat charge for a RAD server. That doesn't exist if you've got Enterprise and Architect now. They're, that's all bundled in for either a, a single server or multi-server, depending on which version you've got. And uh, you know, the pure capabilities of that full scale MEEP and the Docker support that was introduced in 10.3.3, you know, there's some great, great possibilities there. And you know, just talking about Docker, if you've not seen the, the webinar that uh, Malcolm Groves did as the introduction to Docker, recommend going having a look at it. It shows how you can kind of test your databases with multiple different versions very, very easily directly from the IDE, spinning up a Docker instance and ditching it afterwards. And even I had a call the other day where I had to go and use MongoDB and it took me 10 minutes to get set up with a MongoDB database running with everything to be able to go and test and, and you know use the samples that have been passed through. So really, really easy. And uh, David spoke about the, the updates with the C++ debugger and the, the formatter support uh, in depth earlier. So some, some great, great stuff. Guys, before we jump into 
I think we've got probably about seven minutes um, that's, left that's on this. Into questions. Yeah. You can put up the, the the final slide with the summary of the features, but we don't we don't need to talk over it. I mean, we, I think we've covered uh, plenty. I, I think, yeah. Well, we'll leave that up there. For, yeah, we can keep this know. slide up while while we we go through questions. So, are there any that you've got open up on the Q and A log there that you want to quickly pick out? Have you had a chance to have a quick scan down them in the meantime? Or shall I just randomly pick a few out here? There's been a couple of questions around the the community edition. Is there any planned update to get 10.4 out into the community edition? Yes, at some point in time we will have a community edition for 10.4. We still there isn't even an internal decision exactly when. We are we keep supporting the community edition with 10.3, allowing even customers on it to get a new license like for another year. So, but we wanted to make sure primarily that there isn't miss there isn't a misuse of community edition as a trial because we've seen that a little too much and so if you want to try 104 today there is a trial for 104 <laughs> you want community edition because uh, you, you're a hobbyist you can take community edition it's not 104 but it serves the purpose of of using mm -hmm. the product uh, learning about it and deploying application with it and and you're just fine at some point we'll update it, but the idea is that it might always like lag, lag slightly behind the the official release. I'll apologise to people for summarising a number of the the questions. There's been a few different things around, you know, you know, different feature requests and different kind of things coming into the product. You know, what's coming for the future? So maybe I'll just summarise it up as, you know. Are there any plans for updating the roadmap at all at any point and, and having kind of some more public vision of, of what's coming through in the future? There are. I mean, our, our last public roadmap was August last year, which is, is a while ago now. You know, so I don't have an exact date when we're going to update it, but uh, you know, I, I know that's the plan fairly soon. Um, I think now that we have 10.4 out, I mean, 10.4 was a big release with a lot of stuff. And so now is the time to sort of pause and, and put that roadmap out and, and that kind of thing. Wanted to get 10.4 out before before revisiting uh, what's what's next. Yeah, we also probably need to wait next Monday to see what Apple says <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the, the new CPUs for 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 Macs. That that might have some impact on the world, uh, but we will yeah, know until really Monday. Not. So. Yeah, it, 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 it's all very catch up. We need to we need to see what's happening in the industry, try to capture trends, and and then act accordingly. Yeah, there's been a lot of trends and things changing around the market in the last year or so. You know, with the well, even just going back a few a few bits, the 64-bit iOS requirements coming in, and then the Android 64-bit requirement coming in for the for the app stores, and I you know, just looking you know back it's been really impressive how we've been able to have major compilers released within a version without having breaking changes um, for all the third-party components and bits through 10.3 uh, through 10.3 which has mean meant that it's been so much easier to be on the latest version without having all of the pain of having to go through and get all the third-party components updated and all the other kind of bits with some of the the other code and I think you know, my sound gone again. Yeah, uh, I think backed off briefly and it's back, but it sounds different. Perhaps you're using a different mic. No, I think something just keeps cutting out on the microphone. So, yeah, I think it's been great having all the different compiler bits come through and then just kind of keep keep everything going, which without having to kind of have the breaking changes, the code in between, which I think is a great a great thing with the update subscription model now that's in place, um, being allow uh, allowing those kind of things to happen and also then, you know, be much more open with the the roadmap and the timeframes and the lines of, of what's coming through. So, yeah. okay, the, the sixty four bit thing. Oh, sorry, you're going to. No, no, go ahead. Oh, the sixty four bit thing reminds me of something else. Talking about market trends that we we didn't really cover. I mean, we talked about Windows and mobile and that kind of thing, but that is the the sort of rise of, of Windows sixty four bit. I mean, for example, we released new debugger for C plus plus, and that was for Windows sixty four. And you know, you might have a question why why Windows 64, not, not Win32. And one of the, the reasons there is that, yeah, I mean, 64-bit Windows has been around for a long time since uh, I think even XP had a 64-bit version, although not, not many people used it, but certainly by Windows 7. 
many people were using it. You know, Windows applications you know, still run as 32-bit, but we, we are seeing a, a lot of interest in, in 64-bit applications in general, not just because of you know, mobile devices where we have to use 64-bit, but on Windows where, where people really want to use 64-bit for, for other reasons, mm. you know, whether that's memory or whether it's uh, your know, performance or, or something like that. And so if we you know, spend the effort on a, a very significant feature like a, a new debugger, and that is significant, is you know, we're, we're going to put that effort on where, where we see a lot of people moving to, and that's, that's when 64. You know, a lot of people are sort of, you know, we, not only do we have a lot of people already who, who are working with 64-bit, but a lot of people are really working hard to, to move uh, their apps to 64-bit as well. Sometimes you're even abandoning the 32-bit build completely. Yeah, cool. So I'll just have a quick scan down the log to see if there's anything specifically kind of key to, to jump out here. Uh, a number of questions and comments around the community edition, um, which we kind of we've kind of covered through. There's a question here, is there any benefits of letting Delphi run unattended for the LSP to process all of the very large projects? Not as such. I mean, LSP currently, our LSP architecture is, is quite unique, actually. We've done something very advanced. It's, it's a multi-process architecture, so different types of information are provided by different sort of sub-processes. We, we call them agents. Now, it does do something which we call priming, which is when you have a very large project, you know, it does sit and process that first ahead of time, and you, know, you might see your CPU usage go up. It's the equivalent of, of compiling the project. This is something we're still researching. It, it, it gave positive results to, to do that, although equally for some, and this has been very rare, you know, like 1% of customers, if you have an incredibly gigantic project, that can actually be slightly negative. So you know, there's there's an option. It's, it's a registry key to to turn that off. You know, contact support if, if if that's an issue for you. So to return to that, we're we're sort of priming by precompiling, but LSP of course can return results at, at any point. It doesn't require that priming. If you you know in the IDE and you have a, a file open, then LSP has been told that you've opened that file. And so it's, it's sitting up there at the, at the top of its queue to, to look at. And you should be able to get completion results straight away. So that's the sort of a long answer sort of explaining a bit about the reasons. And the answer is no, there's, there's no real benefit to, to waiting a while. You should be able to complete, you know, get completion straight away. But uh, you know, if, if you see CPU usage going on in the background, that's, that's what's happening is sort of preparing stuff for you so that you know, other requests are, are going to be, be ready. Okay. Good, that's a great answer. I, I, it's, it's always kind of nice hearing some of the kind of the cool stuff and the, you know, taking stuff that's there and also going, well, we've learned from what's been done in the market and we've seen some of the feedback people, other vendors have had around their implementations. And actually we've got this kind of cool idea for how to implement it and being able to kind of, you know, learn from others as well. And that's one of the great things in terms of using, you know, kind of this open innovation approach in towards, you know, improving the tooling. You know, on top of the LLVM engine and, and stuff like that as well, which you know certainly helps with some of the compilers, so, which is brilliant. Okay, there's a, I'm just kind of trying to scan down quickly whilst listening to the chat as well for the for the other questions. There's a few people kind of wanting to make feature requests and, and kind of things like that. Again, quality.embarkadero.com. If you've got feature requests or if there's things that you've kind of spotted that you'd like some you know to kind of report through, then um, the quality portal is the is the place to go for that. The other thing I definitely point out, if you haven't seen it already, is the the new kind of location for checking your license numbers and getting the downloads, which is the my.embarkadero.com, uh, a much nicer user interface that loads very very quickly uh, compared to the old Code Central, which for for many of us who've been using version after version after version after version, you know you. It was almost like, sorry, David, it was almost like being a C++ compiler and you know, hitting compile, going, making your cup of tea and come back. But the, the, the new the portal is, is great. So that's my, uh, my.embarkadero.com. Definitely go and have a look at that. And you can literally sort an order and find your serial numbers and, and everything from there, which is great. Yeah, that's built with Centra as well, by the way. Yeah, built with Centra, which is part of the architect edition. So if you're wanting to do any kind of uh, stuff on that, there, and then definitely have a look at the Centra stuff. Uh, in fact, yeah, not strictly uh, 
part of this webinar, but Censure product had a, a CensureCon, which had to move virtually, obviously, because of the, the current situation about you know, three or four weeks ago now. And uh, they actually had sessions there where they were doing their Censure components. But part of the session, they were having to prototype and, and get some data served out to it quickly. So I used Rad Server um, because it was just so quick and easy to do it. Rather than using kind of Node.js or, or something else, they literally just threw down a couple of components with uh, Wizard, Wizard and got the data straight out from the database with paging and, and all that kind of stuff. And bang, off it went, up came the Rad Server. And I then able to do kind of the, the majority of the, the demo just showing the front end connection to that with web technology. So if you do have web teams you know, within, within the company who need to be able to use you know, standard JSON and HTML kind of stuff, then definitely point them at the, the Censure stuff and you can then have the ability with the architect to be able to you know, interact with them and, and show them all the, the kind of the cool stuff working through that as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah, there's a question here about any integration with Visual Studio Code um, with some of the stuff that's been done around LSP or anything. That's something we're, we're considering. I mean, Delphi LSP is an open protocol. So whether we should officially support in Visual Studio Code is something that we're we're thinking about. I don't really have an answer beyond that at the moment, I'm afraid. You know, obviously being an open protocol, it, it's compatible. The LSP uses an initialization message, and we, we send a bit of custom data in that. But that's uh, that's it. But our focus was really as well to to leverage LSP being an open protocol to help uh, support other servers within Red Studio as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we tested with the Python server, for example. It was quite cool to see Python code completion in 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 Red Studio. And that's that's been our focus. But certainly, something like Visual Studio Code is, is something we're we're thinking about. It's the kind of thing you can you know send us an email about or something like that if it's uh, what you you know what you would like to see. Yeah, keep an eye out for the next developer survey at some point in the future, and you know, those kind of things. That feedback is always useful and welcome. Question here about will the IDE fix pack be available for Rad Studio 10.4? Well, that's a question we cannot answer too because it's, it's Andrea's own mm -hmm. and, and responsibility. What we are doing, we'll continue doing is, is select some of his uh, changes and fixes and apply them to the core, to the core product. Uh, we have a specific agreement with Andreas about that and, and we are continually Taking some of his some of his code and and bringing it over, it, some of that is trivial to do because he has some great fixes. Other in other cases, it's a bit tricky because it worked great for 90% of the cases, but but causes some it, it, it's a bit hacky at times here and there. So we need to use some caution because we need to make sure that everything works reliably uh, all over the time. But we are we are incorporating more and more. Of the of the fix back into into the core Rust studio, both at the compiler level and at the at the ID level. Okay, um, just looking at the time, I think we're probably going to need to wrap up. But I'll just leave it with this last uh, comment that's kind of come through from Olivia here. I have not been this excited about a new release of Delphi since XE2 when 64-bit came out. So and I think previous to that is in 20, uh, 2009 with Unicode was was kind of a, a great big jump as well. So yeah, I think there's been a, a lot of a lot of really good feedback around for this new release. So I've not been able to kind of get through all the questions. I say if there's specific feature questions or or things like that, then please uh, you know, do log through to to quality or just email us really, or email us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll just pop a, put the emails back up there. So yeah, thank you very much, everybody. You know, we've had uh, just having a quick look at the the counters here. Developers from over 50 different countries connecting in today for the session. Literally hundreds of you around the world connecting in. So I hope you've kind of found this uh, format uh, useful and slightly different. It's certainly something was kind of fun that we wanted to try compared to the other stuff. For a lot of the questions around the specific controls and, and looking into those bits, please go rewatch the the launch webinar that's on the Embarcadero YouTube channel. Um, have a quick look at the the small overviews to kind of work out which areas you want to kind of go and home into. But there's a lot of really, really good stuff there. And we didn't want to just recopy that here, but give you a chance to kind of have a bit more of a, an understanding of what's happening behind the scenes and to, to kind of get a feel for for where things are going. So any last kind of question, uh, comments from either of you guys, Marco? 
Uh, no, no, enjoy time four. There will be improvement and fixes coming all over the time for the next year until we get to time five. So expect more to come along the, the time four uh, product. And but we, I really think it's it's a great it's a great release mm -hmm. and something we're going to to be like again a good foundation for for also some of the coming coming improvements and, and features. Yeah, David. Yeah, I think this this chat format has been really good. So I I, I hope we do it again. I might try to spend a bit more time on on questions next time as well. I think we we talked a bit too long. So for those of you who ask questions, sorry about that and. Try and try and spend a bit more on on the back and forth next time. But yeah, ten point four has been been really great. It's been it's been very good releasing it. You know, we we know what's coming for a long time and can't always talk about it. Uh, LSP especially, you know, working for months on that and and sort of seeing it is really really exciting to get it out. And it's really nice to see the feedback as well about features like this. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's fantastic. So thank you all for attending. And uh, yeah, I hope hope you enjoyed it and found the, the material useful.